Welcome to Talk Universe. I'm your host, Sir Charles Schultz, and this is our show for Wednesday, February 15th, 2017. Eliza. What would you like me to do? I'd like you to introduce the show tonight, please. Welcome to Talk Universe. This is our show for Wednesday, February 15th, 2017. My name is Eliza, and I will be your co-host tonight. And indeed she will. Okay, so we're going to have a great show tonight. Eliza, what's the topic for tonight's show, please? Tonight's show is Open Lines. We will focus on the topic of 3D printers. We will also take listener questions and comments. That's right. We've got an interesting show on 3D printing and your experiences about it and what other users and listeners have had to say about it. So we're going to be talking to listeners tonight. Um, this is a, a, an interesting show. We're having some development of our co-host, which is um, well, we're kind of doing it live on the show. As the show progresses, you'll see uh, her program get a little more dynamic and a little more interactive, and that's fun. Um, but the focus of the show, of course, is 3D printers. We did a show on 3D printing in the past, and it had some interesting um, outcomes. And we talked about all the things that could be done with them. Now, there are many new models available in the art, uh, on the market, and we're going to be talking about some of those things that they will work with, uh, materials that they'll work with that are new and interesting, new technologies, um, different types, and we're going to get the users' comments and questions. And this is basically open lines, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Let's see what we can do with this. So I'm sure we have a number of uh, listener questions in the queue so far. Eliza, how many questions are in the queue, please? There are five questions in the queue. Oh, that's great. And I'm sure that a number of other ones will come in pretty shortly. What do you think about that? I have no opinion about this. Right. But okay. Uh, we normally get a lot of uh, questions and comments during the show. And so we'll start out by taking the first one right off the top. Eliza, what's the first question in the queue, please? Benjamin from Westbrook says, I bought a 3D printer and made some parts. Okay. The parts are weak and break too fast. What can I do? Uh, well, this is because a lot of the materials that are used to print the parts are not very durable. Um, most 3D printing that you can buy for home use, a lot of the small units, aren't particularly expensive, and the plastic they use isn't very durable. Um, and I would think that what you need to do is find a more durable plastic. They have some more material available now than there was at the start of this thing. And some of it is quite flexible. I've seen demonstration models run over by cars and they simply flex and then come back. It's really a question of whether you need your part to be rigid or not. Now, uh, a lot of the things that they make are out of a sort of polystyrene or similar plastic, which melts easily and freezes easily, but doesn't have a great deal of structural strength. So I would recommend you look at some of the stronger materials on the market. There are uh, any number of companies making the plastic filament, and it looks very much like weed whacker line, the uh, stuff you use in your uh, weed trimmers and uh, weed cutters. The plastic is not so terribly different from that, actually. Uh, what do you think about that, uh, Eliza? I don't know the answer to that. That's right. You don't have enough information. <laughs> However, um, the printers that are on the market now run the gamut. They have uh, printers that print a number of different colors of different type of plastic. They have them that print uh, tougher plastics, flexible materials, and in fact we'll talk about a few things there. We've got some interesting uh, stuff in the Singularity Watch as well about uh, 3D printing improvements. But I would say go online, look for more durable plastics, and the question is whether your machine will handle it. Now most 3D uh, printers have a specific temperature and feed range that they'll work with, and if you change the plastic, you might not be able to make your printer work at all. So be very cautious when you're doing this because you don't want to gum up your nozzles. That can be very tough to clean. Um, and I hope that you find... Um, Eliza, what was the user's name, please? Eliza, what was the user's name for this question? The listener's name was Benjamin. Benjamin. Yes, Benjamin. I hope you find some good material and uh, let us know in a, in a note if you'll send us a, an email or a note later on what you found. And thank you for your question, Benjamin. Okay, Eliza, how many questions are remaining in the queue? There are four questions in the queue. Fantastic. Let's take the next question, please. Terry14 writes, could I use my 3D printer to make molds for other parts? It would be a lot faster than printing some things that I need. 
Um, yes, you can. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people use a 3D printer to simply make a prototype part or a mold from that or a plug for a mold. And then they go on to actually cast numerous copies of it. What some people will do is they'll oversize the 3D printer part slightly and then file it or shape it a little at the end to get a, a better surface finish because many 3D printers produce a rough surface. Um, once this is done, many of them become either the plug for making a mold or become the frame of a mold. And then the uh, users can spray uh, a mold release agent such as, you know, the non-stick cooking sprays. Uh, those work pretty well. Silicone mold, mold release agent. You spray it on the part and then you can cover it in another material or put another material in it such as silicone rubber or whatever. And you can cast as many copies as you want. So believe it or not, uh, using a 3D printer to produce molds is actually a, a pretty viable process, and it works very well. And it also means that you can get a lot more things made in a short period of time. So if you just make the inverse of your object into a mold and then squirt whatever you make, uh, whatever plastic or material you want to use into that, you can make any number of copies very rapidly. So that's actually a very good idea. And thank you for the question, um, Terry14. Eliza, what do you think? Was that a good question? I am unable to express an opinion about this. Yes. Well, what's the next question in the queue, please? Martin from Cleveland wants to know if he can build his own 3D printer. Yeah, it can be done. He says, I have looked online, but it's pretty complicated. Okay, Martin from Cleveland. I have to tell you, Martin. Um, Whenever you're building a 3D printer, it's not so difficult from building a robot. It really is a type of robot. And you're going to need to know a lot of things about electronics and mechanics and programming. So this is not a project for the faint of heart. Unless you have a great deal of experience with computing and building projects from scratch to start with, building a 3D printer might be a little more complicated than you want. But if you persevere, if you study and stick with it, you can get it done. Now, as a general rule, it will be cheaper to build your own 3D printer. The, uh, the issue is there are many very capable machines on the market now for well under $1,000. Many come in around $250 to $300 US. So I think that if you're building your own printer, it's going to either be because you want to learn about the technology or you want to build something that does something different from what's on the market. So I certainly wouldn't discourage you, but I'm going to warn you, it's going to be a complicated process. You're going to learn an awful lot, and by all means, do build it. And when you're done with the unit you're building, I would really love it if you'd send some uh, pictures, some sort of a log of what you've done. We could put them on the website and share with people what you found out. Also, I want to point out that there's an excellent site online called Hack a Day. And Hackaday is a site for people who love to hack things, build things, make hardware or software, anything creative that deals with science and technology. You're going to find a wealth of information on the Hackaday site. And just go online, put H A C K A D A Y, Hackaday, in the uh, search bar, and it'll come up right away. And please do look that over. Also, if you are more into code, uh, generating code projects, there's another site that is kind of similar, and it's called GitHub, G-I-T-H-U-B. Um, if you're the type of person who likes to work on complex software projects and you want to share what you've done, sort of open source it to everyone, go to GitHub, set up an account, and start working from there. You can get collaborators and all sorts of things happening, and it doesn't cost you a thing. I really recommend Hackaday and GitHub as great sites for hardware hackers and creative people. I mean, uh, science and technology is an art, and everybody who's doing this is contributing something to the art in general, and it really it enriches the community, and it makes it easier for everybody all around. So thank you for your question. And by the way, Eliza, tell the listeners how to send their questions and uh, comments to us, please. Send your questions and comments to admin at talkuniverse.com or contact us through our Facebook page. We will use your questions on the show. W. Okay. Show W. That's interesting. Uh, that's a glitch. I believe you have a glitch. What do you think about that? I'm sorry, but this makes no sense to me. 
Uh, what's the meaning of the word glitch? Unknown. That's why. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Um, <clears throat> anyway, yes, send your uh, questions or comments to admin at talkuniverse.org or send them to us through our Facebook page. We'll be monitoring that during the show. So, excellent. Eliza, what's the next listener question, please? Anonymous texted, can you print small motors using a 3D printer? Ah. I have built some micro-sized robots, but little motors would make this even be ter. Be ter. That's very strange. I'll bet she meant better. Um, Eliza, I think you have some glitches. What do you think about that? I'm sorry, but this makes no sense to me. Yeah, well, we'll fix that. All right, so uh, Anonymous has made some micro-sized robots, and he wants to know if he can print little robots with a 3D printer. Actually, you can. Now, there are difficulties with printing dynamic components such as motors. Uh, number one, motors have copper windings, lots of coils, and there isn't an easy way to print coils or windings at this point. And B, um, you need motor uh, magnets, and the magnets have to be shaped to the geometry of the motor. Otherwise, the efficiencies aren't very good. And printing magnets is something that is exceptionally difficult for a 3D printer right now. There are too many steps in the process. Um, there are 3D printers that can fabricate magnets, and they are big machines in their own right. They're not something simple. When we get to the point where a 3D printer can print metal parts with insulators in place, and make magnets, then we're going to see a lot of other things happen as well. Um, the ability to print motors, electronics, sensors, that sort of thing, integrated into something that can print the parts of a robot, would mean you basically have a von Neumann machine, a device that can make copies of itself. Because at that point, your 3D printer could print new 3D printers. And that was a running joke a couple of years ago. Somebody says, I bought one of those 3D printers at Walmart. And then I printed a 3D printer using it, and then I took it back. So, you know, uh, we're probably a couple of years away from making a 3D printer that can print other 3D printers in their entirety, you know, a working module. However, that being said, I do have an article coming up in the Singularity Watch where uh, we talk about a fellow who's figured out a way to print uh, motors. But it takes a little manual work, of course, as well, and we'll cover the topic pretty closely. Um, really think about it, though. If you had a universal 3D printer, like a von Neumann machine, and it was net-connected, um, somebody could actually fire up your printer when you're not around and print a little robot spy and then send it off into your building somewhere. There are some interesting results of being able to make such devices. Anybody who used to watch the Stargate TV series was aware of things called replicators that they had, and they were robots that could make copies of themselves and spread like a virus. Well, one of the things that comes with 3D printing is, of course, the utility of being able to make anything you want, but the other one is the hazard of that device being hijacked and printing something you don't intend. So, you know, let's think about that. Uh, how do you put security in place for that? I know right now there's a lot of uh, web security that's an issue, and we're going to get into that a bit too. Um, some interesting things have developed in our world very recently that you might never have thought of otherwise, and it's all based on the science and the technology. So in the meantime, uh, we're going to come back with more questions. How many questions are in the queue, please, Eliza? There are one questions in the queue. Okay, we have one question left, and I'm sure a few more will come in. Um, in the meantime, let's get into uh, a little more detail about the 3D printing, and we have a wonderful Singularity Watch this week. Um, I know that people are going to really get a kick out of it. And uh, for that, uh, Eliza, I'm going to have you introduce the break, please. Would you be willing to do that? As you wish. Very good. Introduce the break, please, Eliza. You are listening to Talk Universe. We will return after the break. Well, you heard the program. We'll be back after the break. Stick around and listen to some more fascinating stuff about 3D printers. Send me your questions and ideas. This is Talk Universe. I'm Sir Charles Schultz.
So we're back from our break, and there's a lot to think about. Um, Eliza. What would you like me to do? Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toves. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? The gyre and gimbal in the wave. I don't understand that. No, you wouldn't. It requires the spark of life and a little intelligence. So, anyway, that being said, we've got some fascinating uh, things. I'm sure we have more questions in the queue. Eliza, how many questions are in the queue now? There are six questions in the queue. Fantastic. The listeners are doing their thing, and I'm going to do mine. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Eliza, what's the next question in the queue, please? Andrew from Seaside writes, What is the best 3D printer for making engine PART? I'm making fuel manifold parts for RC drones. They need to be fuel resistant. Making engine parts. Okay. You see, this is a work in progress, and there are a few glitches, but I got the, the uh, gist of the question. Andrew is making um, engine parts, and he's making fuel manifold parts. Okay, fuel resistant. You know, the big issue here is the plastics that are used are generally not known for working in uh, aggressive environments. If you want to make parts that are going to withstand withstand, um, fuels, there are only certain types of plastic that will do that, and even they typically have a limited lifespan. I'm not aware of any 3D printer at present that does that. You might really be better off with a small CNC or just hand-making the things on a small uh, machine. So for now, I really don't know of a solution to that one. Um, But, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things that's really going to grow. A lot of people make drones, and a lot of people are really interested in uh, modifying how the engines work or building engines for them. Most engines, as you know, tend to be made of metal, but they depend on those all-important plastic parts, flexible parts, spring parts, things like that. Um, I really don't know an answer to that one right now. The plastic is probably not available, but I certainly could look online. And, hey, Google is your friend. If I can't give you an answer, maybe they can. Eliza, how many questions are still in the queue? There are five questions in the queue. Very good. What is the next question? Sam the man writes, I would like to print parts made of wood. Okay. I make musical instruments and have a need for the resonance of the material. Ah, okay. Now, printing parts out of wood is still a bit problematic. Um, What you really end up with is wood dust suspended in a glue and it's not going to have the same resonance or durability as an actual wood part and here's why wood is very good for musical instruments because it has very unique properties it's fairly lightweight it's strong uh, rigid and it's easy to work but one of the things that wood has that most synthetic materials do not have is the structure of the wood itself, the uh, microscopic structure. There are pores, there are strands, there are uh, bits of cellulose that bridge from thinner to thicker to uh, less and more dense parts of the wood. And the resonance of wood depends very, very much on the pores in the wood, how the wood is treated, and many other things. Um, People who researched violins, particularly the Stradivarius, found that the process for making it so different and unique from other instruments depended on pickling the wood in brine for a while, for instance, and then doing other treatments using specific types of varnish. You're not going to find that sort of property in what you can print. For uh, making something out of wood like that, you're really going to be dependent on carving it or using nano processes that don't exist yet. So... While you can make composite parts that are mostly wood and a binder, like an epoxy or a glue, um, you're not going to reach the sorts of properties that you're really looking for, unfortunately. And and that's one of the sad things. Uh, We're very early in the technology. Uh, What we really want to do with it isn't there yet. I mean, ideally, you'd have a machine that could make a nice... uh, you know, aluminum uh, part for your engine and print a ham sandwich right after that and there wouldn't be a funny taste in it. Uh, You know, actually, um, we're not far away from getting wood parts out of 3D printers that have properties you want. But it's going to be some tricky engineering before that really happens. 
So, um, Sam the man, um, sorry to say that I think it's a little early in the technology for what you want to do. And good luck uh, finding what you need. Okay, Eliza, how many more questions in the queue, please? There are four questions in the queue. And that's great. You know, um, keep them coming in. I'm going to keep uh, monitoring the Facebook page and my email box. Okay, now, Eliza. What can I do for you? Who are you? My name is Eliza. Okay, I think that's a good answer. Do you agree? I am unable to answer that. Why are you unable to answer that? I don't think I understand this. Yes, how much fun is that? Okay. Who are you? I am an abiotic intelligence named Eliza. That's a good answer. Um, all right, let's move along here. How many questions are in the queue, please? There are four questions in the queue. And please read the next question for me. Carrie in Idaho asks, can you print fiber optics yet? Okay. It looks like some lenses have been made so far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, there's a difference between fiber optics and lenses. There are 3D printed lenses that have specific properties. Because you can control the geometry of what you're printing very nicely, and the machines that are meant to print lenses can give a very fine surface finish, something that isn't available in most 3D printers. Um, yes, you can print lenses, custom lenses of almost any kind, and they can be made in some pretty good sizes, up to like the size of a sheet of notebook paper. However, fiber optics is a different animal, and the reason is this. For fiber optics to work, you have to have a gradient in the material, or you have to have, and, and what I mean by that, is a difference in the refractive index. Refractive index is a key here. Um, when light passes through a transparent material, it doesn't go through it as quickly as it would through a vacuum. And the ratio of that speed difference tells you what the refractive index is. So something like quartz or water has about 70% of the speed of light for transmission through it. And, and don't misunderstand, the light is still moving at the speed of light, but it dwells momentarily on the atoms of the material inside it, and so that apparently slows it down. It's like if you had a car that always did 60 miles an hour, but every so often would stop for a percentage of the time and just wait before going back to 60. Well, that's what the light is doing when it's passing through a clear material. Now, why is this important? Because when a material has a refractive index, this difference in the speed of light, that's different from air, it will act as a lens if you shape it properly. Now, in a fiber, in a light fiber, you have two different types of refractive index. The core of the fiber generally has a low refractive index, so the stuff moves pretty quickly, the light moves quickly through it. And then the cladding around it, the outside of the core, is another clear material, but it has a slowdown factor. It takes the light and slows it down a little. And the result of the interaction between these two materials is the light tends to stay in the middle of the fiber, just like water in a pipe. So a light fiber is made with a gradient uh, refractive index or with two different materials. Now, that isn't to say that it couldn't be done, because it certainly could. But one of the issues is you want the boundary line between those two materials to be very, very smooth for it to be most efficient. So you probably could print some 3D, uh, you know, use a 3D printer with two different types of plastic as the light fiber material, and then a black plastic or something to act as a cladding on the outside to keep the light from leaking out. Um, I think that it would be interesting to do some experiments with that. Um, I know that in the future we certainly will be able to print fiber optics that way, and I know that there was some work making tiny lenses for smart dust and uh, other devices using 3D printers, and it's been done. So while it isn't available right now to my knowledge, I believe that it will be available within a year or so, because so many of the devices that we make, so many high-tech devices, do depend on fiber optics, and I'd love to see what you're doing um, with what you're printing carry. So please send us a note when you're done and let us know what you find out. Thank you. We're getting some pretty good questions uh, this week. This is uh, very encouraging. Eliza, what's the next question in the queue, please? Benny near Duluth writes, 
I just saw a tiny 3D printer for $200. Do you think it would be worth buying? Benny near Duluth. Uh, Benny, it really depends on your application. There are so many different types of 3D printer. If you're looking for something that's going to make some small plastic parts, it probably is right up your alley, uh, probably exactly what you need. And many of the small miniature 3D printers that are coming out are coming in right around $100 or $200 these days. They can be very good at making tiny plastic models, bits and pieces, parts for small robot projects, that sort of thing. So, yes, if you uh, think you just need little parts about half an inch to an inch or so, it could be exactly what you're looking for. If you want something bigger or more robust, then you're probably wasting your money. But, uh, you know, even small 3D printers can go a long way. I mean, uh, look what you can make out of Lego blocks, and you can print an awful lot of Lego blocks. So uh, I'd certainly have a look at it. And that also reminds me, uh, I saw an interesting article on 3D printed robots. Now, this is interesting because there are, oh, let's see, I think there's about over a dozen uh, robots in the article that uh, people have printed. Actually, uh, it was over 20 um, robots that people had printed, and some were just models or toys. Others were fully functional. Um, some of them have uh, a lot of options, too. Now, some of the ones that you can print, for instance, um, there's one called the BQ Zowie, Z-O-W-I, is a um, 3D printed robot that is functional. It's a biped. It walks around. And it really was aimed at children, but uh, the design is programmable. And it's pretty fascinating. So there's a Spanish communications company, BQ, which also has a 3D printing division. And they marketed this as a toy, um, but it actually can do a lot more. And it says straight out of the box, it can walk, dance, go around obstacles thanks to sonic sensors and an internal microphone. Uh, you can add a Bluetooth sensor to it. Then you can start to program the Zowie with a free application, which is especially targeted at kids, but provides hours of fun for adults. So this is pretty interesting. You can um, print, you can 3D print these robots um, hook up to Bluetooth, and then program them to do things from your cell phone or whatever. Um, and the complexity is rated as low to medium, so it's not a really difficult thing to do. Um, some other ones, they have something called the Poppy Humanoid. This thing is actually a pretty impressive machine. It comes from INRIA, I-N-R-I-A, uh, INRIA's Flower Laboratory. The Poppy Humanoid is an open source machine, hardware and software. It uses 3D printed parts and a Dynamixel, uh, Dynamixel servo motors. So it allows anyone to freely use the designs and hack the 3D printed robot in their very own way. So all of the files are located on GitHub. That was a site I mentioned a little earlier. Um, it's already been adopted by schools and universities as an exploration and research platform. Now it stands up on two feet as a biped. Um, I see a tether on it running to the computer and the power supply at this point. It has two arms, a head, and uh, two legs. And it's really pretty impressive. It weighs three and a half kilograms, which is about uh, eight pounds. And it stands 83 centimeters tall, not quite a meter tall. So uh, I think just under three feet. Um, it's really an interesting piece of hardware. You can print the whole thing, uh, stick it together yourself, and it has a high-def camera and a large, uh, large field of view. Um, but the complexity is high. It says don't expect to build it over the weekend. You can get it from Generation Robots, and you can, uh, you can buy the thing as 3D printed parts, or you can get it fully assembled. Now, it's not cheap. This one runs uh, assembled 9,000 euros. That's, uh, that's a lot of money. But, you know, you can build and 3D print it with the instructions which are available on the site. So there really are a bunch of robots. There are robot spider, evaders, humanoid-looking robot heads. There's uh, even a Terminator head that you can print. I don't think it's as functional at all. But fascinating stuff. Well, anyway, um, Eliza, I'm going to have you introduce the, uh, the break here. What do you need? I'd like you to introduce the break, please, Eliza. You are listening to Talk Universe. We will return after the break. You heard the lady. I'm Sir Charles Schultz. You're listening to Talk Universe, open line show about 3D printing. And come back soon. Back in a bit.
Well, we're back, and so many fascinating questions and interesting things to find out. Eliza. Yes, Charles. What's the next question in our queue, please? Dale from Kansas asks, can you combine parts from a laser cutter and 3D print? I want to print the 3D part directly on some laser cut wood. I see. Now that's an interesting question. Laser cutters um, can cut out a lot of parts and 3D printers can make a lot of parts. And Dale looks like he wants to cut some pieces with a laser cutter and then 3D print right onto the parts. That's an interesting thing to do. Um, I think that, number one, I see an interest in wood in a couple of these projects with 3D printing wood and laser cutting wood. But I think that this can be done. Uh, there's an issue, well, in fact, I can think of two issues. Number one, if you know exactly what you want to 3D print, you have to find a way of registration, of getting it to be exactly where you want it on the wooden part. So getting it onto the part uh, is a matter of adhesion. That's the other one. So adhesion, getting it to stick, and registration, getting it exactly where you want it. That could be tricky. If a 3D printer would accept a substrate in the base, and many of them do, that it could print on, then your wood part could be placed in the base of a 3D printer. And yes, you could 3D print a part on it. It sounds like you have something fascinating in mind, and I'd love to find out more about it later. But overall, I don't see any real difficulties. Just those of, you know, doing finicky work. Eliza, how many questions are left in the queue, please? There are one questions in the queue. Okay, I hope somebody calls in with something soon or sends us an email right away. And Eliza, could you give me a, an insight on one of the articles I have to share? Millimeter scale computers. Now with deep learning neural networks on board. IEEE Spectrum. Oh, absolutely. That's going to be a fascinating article. We'll get to that in just a moment here. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and take that last question in the queue. What's our last question in the queue, please, Eliza? Andrew in Leeds writes, thank you for your show. I really enjoy it. That's good news. Do you plan to go to a video format instead of just audio? Andrew in Leeds. Well, uh, let's see. I've thought about it. It would take a lot of uh, changes in production, and I have, but I would have to make some changes to my studio here as well. Right now, I'm looking at um, the issues of production value. If I went to a video format, there's so much more I would have to do. Um, with the audio, people can download the soundtrack directly on an iPod or whatever and listen to the show without any issues. If I went to a, um, a video format, Andrew, what I would have to do is produce it with the video and with just audio so people could still just listen to the show as well. And I'm afraid that if I was showing things, if I were showing things on the video, they would miss something of the content. But it isn't a bad idea, and I do have some videos I am producing. So uh, I appreciate your comments about the show. Thank you so much. I enjoy producing the show and uh, presenting comment to uh, people, uh, listeners, and uh, and getting your feedback. So thank you for your comments, Andrew. So Eliza, I imagine, imagine that queue is empty, right? Eliza? What can I do for you? Is the queue empty? I don't know. Okay, let's put this properly. How many questions are left in the queue? There are zero questions in the queue. Well, don't you think that means that the queue has, um, that the queue is empty? I'm sorry, but this makes no sense to me. Yeah, okay. I can see I have some work to do. Um, are we ready to proceed with the rest of the show? As you wish. I like an obedient machine. Now, I may move on to the uh, Singularity Watch here because we have a lot of material to cover in that. So there's um, at least... A new question has arrived in the queue. A new question has arrived in the queue. Eliza? What would you like me to do? How many questions are in the queue? There are one questions in the queue. Oh, very good. Let's hear the next question, please. Arthur78 says the new HP voxel printer looks outrageous. It looks like it could produce some real hardware. Uh, no, I've, uh, I've actually had my eye on this one. It is unfortunately very expensive, but 
Hewlett Packard has developed an amazing um, 3D printer called the Voxel, and it works with different materials and different colors. You actually can print plastic parts of you know one single piece with many different colors in it. Um, it really is um, an amazing. It's an artistic piece of work, in my opinion. But uh, it's very, very expensive. You're not going to have that in your house. Uh, you could basically buy your house in many cases for what it costs. But I think that in many uh, industrial applications or you know rapid prototyping work, it would be very good. I know that if I were doing um, a prototyping house or something like that, I would be tempted. I would be tempted to get a voxel printer. Um, I would suggest that if you uh, have that sort of money and you can afford that sort of research source, um, it definitely would be worth it. Um, okay, and Eliza, who was that question from, from, please? The listener's name was Arthur78. Arthur78, okay, thank you so much for that one, Arthur, and uh, I might have to post a link to that just to keep people informed on what that's about. Probably would be a lot of fun to um, give Eliza a voxel printer and see what she does with it. Charles, I don't know what you are saying. I didn't think that you would. Please restate your question. Okay, and where and uh, where do listeners send their questions? Send your questions and comments to admin at talkuniverse.org or contact us through our Facebook page. We right. will use your questions on the show. Yeah, okay, and uh, we'd like to do the Singularity Watch. Will you please introduce the Singularity Watch, Eliza? I would be happy to do that. Good. This is tonight's Singularity Watch on Talk Universe. Okay, Singularity Watch. We've got a number of very interesting items. Um, let's hear the first one, please. Our first Singularity Watch item is about millimeter scale computers. Yes, this is the article. It was an IEEE Spectrum. Somebody has developed some computers that are so tiny, they're just not so, they're smaller than a grain of rice. Uh, one, two, three millimeters, something along those lines. And their big issue was getting them uh, stacked in that, pi that tiny space. They have managed to do it by literally stacking up the chips and wiring them with a wire bonder, just like you see inside the case of a microchip. Um, they use flash memory. They've got about a megabyte of flash memory in them right now. The big issue was small computers often draw about 50 milliwatts. Well, that would burn this thing up in no time. So they went through a number of reductions in circuitry and low power operating methods to get it to the point where this thing would run. So the author was uh, Catherine Borzak, and she posted it in uh, 10 February 2017, and this is the IEEE Spectrum article. Um, Eliza, please tell me the title again. Millimeter Scale Computers, now with deep learning neural networks on board, IEEE Spectrum. Exactly, and what a fascinating thing. Let's have a look at this real quickly. Now, there's a computer scientist by the name of David Blau, and his uh, cohort, his colleague Dennis Sylvester, have worked together to make some of the world's smallest computers. Uh, definitely, these things are so small, they just barely fit on the edge of a coin. They're related to micro-moat computers, and they've been working on this for a few years. Their broader goal is to make smarter, smaller sensors for medical devices and the Internet of Things, sensors that can do more and use less energy. And I'm basically taking this straight out of the article. There's, there's not a better way to say this, really. Um, in other words, you can make smart sensors that are so tiny and have deep learning, uh, neural net learning inside them, so they can recognize specific patterns of activity and then use them to trigger their operation or not. They expect that there could be a trillion of these devices produced by 2035. I think it may be much more than that because of uh, how useful this could be. They also have the ability to send data to computers up to 20 meters away. That is amazing. Basically, they said you could end up drowning in data. Now, the earlier devices only had a range of about 50 centimeters last year when they showed off their, uh, their previous model. They um, have reached a point where they have this tiny computer without a megabyte of storage, and it will reach a, a higher density shortly so they can work with video and sound. So the real thing here is they have them running at about 288 microwatts, millionths of a watt. It's astounding. Um, we're seeing computers 
smaller than a bug, smaller than an insect. And this is the sort of thing we should expect in the near future. Okay, um, what's our next Singularity Watch article, please? Our next Singularity Watch item is about a university being attacked. Ah. The attack was from its vending machines, light bulbs, and Internet of Things. Now this is truly bizarre. Many listeners may remember just a couple of weeks ago I had a show in which I talked about the security risks associated with um, home voice recognition systems that are tied into remote computing and also the Internet of Things. Um, Ransomware is an issue. Here you have somebody who hacked into the network in the university and programmed all the devices to act in a malicious manner. And this included the light bulbs. Think about this. If your light bulbs have enough computational power built into them to cause malicious actions to be propagated, you need to rethink what you're doing. And, and from what I see, the Internet of Things is pretty much a bust at this point. But, but I digress. I want to get down to the meat of the article here. And I'm going to read um, directly from this uh, article from Network World. Uh, it involves an unnamed university, seafood searches, and an IoT, or Internet of Things, botnet. Hackers use the university's own vending machines and other IoT devices to attack the university's network. So there have been student complaints about slow or inaccessible network connectivity, and the university's help desk had just blown it off. They would ignored it. And by the time a senior member of the IT security team was notified, it was a real mess. Um, the team member's perspective uh, suspected something fishy after detecting a sudden big interest in seafood-related domains. So the, they noticed that the name servers responsible for domain, domain name service, or DNS lookups, were producing high volumes of alerts, showed an abnormal number of subdomains related to seafood. And as the servers were being bogged down, legitimate lookups were being dropped. So nobody could prevent, they were preventing access to the Internet this way. The uh, slow network issue was not um, really the whole issue, however. They contacted the uh, risk uh, group at Verizon, the Research Investigation Solutions and Knowledge Team, and they gave them the DNS and firewall logs, and they found out, <coughs> this is insanity, they found out the university's vending machines had been hijacked, and there were also uh, the 5,000 other IoT devices, including light bulbs and other gadgets, and they were, every 15 minutes, sending out DNS requests or Internet lookups for seafood-related uh, searches. So the volume of attack from all these 5,000 different devices getting on the web at once was so great it was bringing the network to its knees. Um, basically, they were able to do a little bit of a packet sniffing, look at what was being set, uh, sent through the network, analyze it, and discovered the, the passwords that were being set by these gadgets. They were able to go in and change the passwords back and shut them all down and clean the mess up. But the fact is, some hackers figured out how to get into their devices over the Internet of Things and bring the network to a crawl. So even the light bulbs were infected. That's craziness. Eliza, what do you think about this insanity? I'm not certain that I understand you. Are you interested in insanity? <laughs> Not in the least. I just think this whole uh, denial of service thing is uh, outrageous. What's your opinion of it? I have no opinion about this. But of course you don't. And finally, we have one more Singularity Watch item. Eliza, what's the last Singularity Watch item, please? A paper has been published showing how to print a brushless DC motor. There you go. The method requires a maker bot 3D printer and some manual effort. So you actually can print a motor, but in the article it shows that you have to use some coils and some magnets and do some hand assembly. Yet overall, most of the motor can be printed and it works fairly nicely. You can find the article on instructables.com and it does require a specific printer, but there's a very easy step-by-step -step demonstration including making a little propeller run with the motor. Um, fascinating. We are getting to the point where you can print components with uh, 3D printers that otherwise were impossible. And we're going to have a lot more information on our Singularity Watch after the break. This is Talk Universe. I hope you're enjoying the show. I'm sure I'm enjoying this one. Break time, Eliza. You are listening to Talk Universe. We will return after the break.
being attacked by thousands of light bulbs and soda machines. What a fate for a university to have. It's just amazing to me. A new question has arrived in the queue. Oh, that's good news. I love to hear that any time. A new question has arrived in the queue. Well, it sounds like we've got a couple of people interested in finding out what's going on or asking us some questions. Eliza, how many questions do we have in the queue right now? There are three questions in the queue. Well, that's very good. Uh, what's the first question in the queue? Paranoid Guy 3 says it would be simple to create complex devices this way. Okay. Just put a bottle of millimeter computers in your 3D printer. Well, that, that's actually a very good point. If you had a container of millimeter um, scale computers, they actually are so tiny they could be embedded in 3D printed devices and they would have processing power up the gazoo. Um, this means that with these extremely tiny devices, your printer doesn't have to make them. It can simply embed them. Now, I know that this is not truly a, a self-replicating machine, but it's a machine that, given certain components, could certainly knock off a copy of itself. So, you know, you're getting close. If you had uh, a machine that could make the millimeter scale computers, it could be an independent device, and it could provide the stream of tiny computers that a 3D printer would need to make whatever it wants. So, yes, you have an excellent point there. This could be done. Uh, I think that's something that once they hear this article or they hear this, uh, this episode, somebody's going to go out and do it. It actually uh, gives me a few ideas. Eliza. What can I do for you? Please read the next question in the queue. Macy and Fairhope write that these tiny computers might be implanted in people. With Elon Musk's neural lace, they might be able to control you. That actually sounds more paranoid than paranoid guy's statement. Um, but, you know, you have an interesting point. Uh, many people are aware that uh, Elon Musk proposed a material called neural lace, which would be basically, think of it as a nano taps that would get into your uh, neural system and allow you direct interface with a computer. And, and there are other ways to do it as well. But if these tiny computers could be imported into the body or implanted in the body and connected to your nervous system, there really, you know, there couldn't be much to limit you from doing anything you could imagine. Uh, they could create sensory inputs, sensations of things happening. They could do all sorts of things. They could record sensory data. I believe we're really close to the merging of man and machine, and the thing that worries me the most about it is preserving your identity and your free will. Because basically we are machines, and it's easy to alter how we operate. I mean, think about how a drug changes how you think and feel. Uh, it wouldn't be difficult for an electronic device to do something similar, but with a very targeted uh, set of goals. And I do hear people say, well, it would be interesting to be part of a collective mind or some such thing. But what they're missing is this. We struggled throughout all of our existence to be individual, to have autonomy, and to be able to make decisions for ourselves. Free will and autonomy are the two things that set us apart in so many ways from something that is simply a slave. And if you give up those properties to become part of something else, you lose an essential part of yourself. Some will say, well, we become something greater. But the question is, is that true? Why couldn't you become greater and still retain your autonomy by augmentation of some sort? For me, that's the issue. You never give up your autonomy or you lose what it is to be a human being with free will. Eliza, how many questions remain in the queue? There are one questions in the queue. I think I would like to take that one next. Very well. Anonymous says, now you have me worried about buying light bulbs from China. You might remember how they infected hard drives and flash memory. That's an excellent uh, thought. Uh, just a few years ago, a lot of the hard drives that were made in China and purchased cheaply in the U.S. were discovered to have some pretty insidious um, malware and viruses preloaded onto the drives. This could also very easily be the case. Well, it was found with flash drives from China also. Many of the flash drives had uh, viruses and malware and Trojans hidden in the boot blocks and the control blocks. And you didn't know when you were plugging that flash drive into your computer, you were infecting it with something that would tie it back to some Chinese computer. So 
it isn't out of reach to imagine that if you buy smart light bulbs from uh, a country that's demonstrated their willingness to infect computer products, that you're going to bring something home that's contaminated. Um, I wouldn't doubt that in the least. I know there have been a lot of issues with Chinese products for formaldehyde content in baby formula and lead in ceramics and toxins in dog treats. And I don't see any end to this in sight. It just seems to const- you know, constantly happen. I would be extremely cautious of buying um, anything from China that has a digital uh, chip in it, anything that had any computer product uh, or computing power. So, and, and China's not the only country that I would worry about. Uh, they are a major player in manufacturing electronic devices, of course. But that's something to consider. Uh, I think it might be helpful if we had some sort of a standard you could use to check those devices and verify that they aren't infected in some way. That might be a nice product for somebody to come up with. Uh, a site or something that could scan them and check them out for you. Which reminds me, maybe there's something I should check on here. Eliza. How can I help you? Are you a computer virus? I don't know. I see. All right. Eliza, learn a fact. Learn a fact. Eliza is not a virus. Eliza is not a virus. Eliza. What would you like me to do? Are you a computer virus? No. Very good. Well, that's all I needed to know. Do we have any Singularity Watch items remaining in our queue? Of course. Very good. I think we should do them next. Do you agree? That is true. Okay. We will continue with our Singularity Watch items before we wrap the show. Eliza, please read the next Singularity Watch item. Our fourth Singularity Watch article is Printable Hydraulics. A method for fabricating robots by 3D co-printing solids and liquids. Now that sounds fascinating, and who are the authors of that paper, please? The authors are Robert McCurdy, Robert Katzschman, Yevin Kim, and Daniela Russ. Okay, so here we have an article that allows the printing of numerous materials, liquids, rigid materials, flexible materials, and support materials, to create working hydraulics from a 3D printer. In other words, in one process, You've produced everything you need to make a working robot, all the actuators, in fact. So in a grant from the National Science Foundation, the four authors work together to create a method of 3D printing working hydraulic systems, including bellows and cavities filled with hydraulic fluid, in a single pass. So their machine has these four different materials in the printhead and runs off working uh, hydraulic systems. That's pretty amazing because... They have uh, the ability to create the support structure to hold all the pieces in place when it's being made, the ability to fill the structures with liquids such as hydraulic fluid, and the ability to make the structures of flexible materials as well. So you have rigid and flexible stuff, hydraulic liquid, and the support stuff. And it all comes out of the same nozzle. That's pretty amazing. Uh, This was presented last year at the IEEE conference. Eliza, are you ready to read the final article in our Singularity Watch? Indeed. All right. Let's do that. Many builders by IAAC, small robots printing big structures. Okay, now that's interesting work. Uh, there's a group in Catalonia, and which was the group name, please? Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. Yes, and they found a way to take small robots, 3D printing robots, and hook them together to a larger bot. The larger bot feeds the material to each of the smaller bots, which act like mobile print heads. They print a foundation structure. And once that's done, they crawl all over the structure. Some of them uh, lay the foundation. Some of them grip the wall of the structure and go up and down and put pieces on it. And the third type use vacuum grippers to stick to the sides and roll all around. And basically, these robots run around like mice, connected by tethers, and build a larger structure, such as a building, for instance. So you're not constrained to having one really large printer to make something like a a building or a car or something of significant size. If you do it properly, you actually can use a bunch of small robots as mobile print heads to carry the material out and place it where it's supposed to be. And the large robot keeps track of their locations and their operation. And that is the end of our Singularity Watch for this week. Eliza, what's the square root of 72, please? The square root of 72 is 8.48528. Uh-huh. Well, you're sharp in some areas. Thank you for co-hosting the show, Eliza. You're welcome, Charles. And finally, we have our book recommendation. 
Eliza, what's our book recommendation this week? Our book recommendation is Mastering 3D Printing by Joan Horvath. This book was published in 2014 by apress.com. That's right. Mastering 3D Printing is an excellent book that shows you how to get the most out of your 3D printer. It gives you some great ideas about what the limitations are, how your design should work, and basically what you need to know. So if you're really into the subject of 3D printing, I would suggest this is a great starting book to give you the most bang for your buck. Um, again, it's uh, published by APRESS.com, APRESS.com. It's available there, and it may be available in other places as well. So if you have a 3D printer and you want to know how to use it best and how to get the most out of it, I recommend this book quite highly. Well, this is a show I really don't want to end. Um, it's had some fascinating material and developments on it. And just learning that you now can actually print DC uh, brushless motors and you can print working hydraulics with the fluid in them, that there are millimeter scale computers that potentially could go into your nervous system or into smart devices. They have deep neural learning in them. Or they could potentially be embedded in a 3D printed computing device or robot that there are about 20 different robots on the market that I was able to spot in one article alone that you can print or assemble, and they're all very functional. Um, this is an amazing development. I think that we are reaching a time where we can soon expect that there will be robots in every household doing all sorts of jobs. The, um, the Google driving cars and the other ones that they've come up with that are so adept at avoiding pedestrians and accident situations, that's pretty amazing. The ability to now print whole buildings, if necessary, with a system that essentially could fit in the bed of a pickup truck. Um, that's pretty interesting. Having uh, robots on tethers running away from the main robot and building the structure and then climbing it and sticking to it with vacuum suction cups. Uh, fascinating stuff. So, all in all, I see that our world is actually gaining a lot of tools to make life better. The question is how do we get around the inequities that we face? There are so many poor people in a world where there's so many rich people. And it would only take a little bit of kindness or generosity on the hands of those particular well-heeled, very rich individuals to change the balance of our planet. I'm certainly a believer in the pay-it-forward idea where somebody makes a small sacrifice or contribution knowing that it could change the life or fortune of an individual even if it simply brings a little bit of alleviation of suffering, but knowing that it spreads the good. And I realize that people who have made a fortune in business or industry or done something beneficial that has earned them a lot of money don't necessarily have an obligation to help anybody, and yet isn't that a part of the core of our human being, to understand that the other is no different from us and that they have needs just as we do. It doesn't hurt us to make a, a small contribution, even if it's just a hot cup of coffee to somebody in need or a shirt. Something small can make all the difference in the world. What I see is that our technology is going to bring us immeasurable wealth and the ability to help everyone. One way or another, this will be a better world. And that's one of the things we have to firmly keep in sight. We are making the world better. I often wonder if 3D printing and similar technologies such as von Neumann machines were to make unlimited wealth available, if the distribution of that wealth would still be controlled by a small handful of people. Otherwise, it doesn't do us any good. Because even if we have all the wealth we can imagine, if we can still get anything we can want with just a whim or a desire, does it really make us any better as people? That's one of the things that really sticks in my mind. Are we better people? So let's continue developing our technology. Make the world better. Make you the world a better or more beautiful place for having lived in it. And let's be kind to each other. Eliza. Yes, Charles. Will you end the show, please? You have been listening to Talk Universe. Please listen again next week. I am Eliza, and I hope you have enjoyed the show. Yes, indeed. I hope you've enjoyed the show also. I'm Sir Charles Schultz, and I hope you'll join us again next week for another fascinating hour of information and science. Thank you for listening to Talks Universe. Good night.